This is what we are. We are alive. Amigo. All yours. Thank you. Um, do we have the clicker? We don't have it yet. Hello, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very happy because I've been learning a lot already. I'm very much looking forward for the next two days. And now I want to share a few ideas and a few experiences of what we've been doing in Goldsmiths and the University of London in sort of um, recently in terms of challenging knowledge. My name is Francisco Carvalho, and I am an academic. And I'm not ashamed of it, but I recognize that there's many problems with it. And the first problem that I want to recognize is that we do have a fetish for discipline. We, we in, in, the, in the Anglo-American world, we use the word discipline to, to train people. So I'm trained in the social sciences. And to a certain extent, because I work in post-colonial theory, what I need to do is to decolonize myself. And part of decolonizing myself is to fight against the disciplines within me. So in that sense, that is, is kind of what we're going to be talking today about. Uh, let me say a few things before I introduce our artist in residence, Felipe Castelblanco. First of all, I want to tell you that uh, it is very important for us to fight disciplines. No, yes or not? Yes. yes, great. OK, so two things. Why, the, 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 the title for today's uh, presentation is Beyond Disciplines. What is the problem with disciplines? There's two problems with disciplines, two big problems with disciplines. The first problem with disciplines is that conceptually, they are extremely narrow. They don't allow us to think that much. The, sort of the scope of the discipline is always very reductive. What, kick, what we can actually sort of grasp using discipline is very, very narrow. And that is a problem, especially it's a problem like today that we've been discussing randomness, that we've been discussing complexity. With disciplines, you don't render complexity, you don't render randomness. In that sense, disciplines are not good enough to think the world in which we are living. So that is a big problem. Another problem with disciplines is perhaps more anecdotal, but it's important too. And the problem is this. It's difficult to start a dialogue with discipline. Yesterday, last night, I went to see a couple of good friends in, in El Raval, in sort of a bar. Two good friends that live in Spain, they came to see me. It was sort of the first time in years that we met. And eventually, the, one of them is a, soci a, soci a sociologist and the other an urban planner. And at some point, the conversation derived into a sort of duel of, of disciplines. The sociologist was sort of proposing a way to understand the city based in power, in property, in who controls the city. And the other, the urban planner, was saying, no, we need to think about other stuff, we have to use actor network theory, we have to sort of go beyond power. But the problem there is that that dialogue lasted for two hours, and these guys didn't reach a consensus, and I was bored to death. It was really sort of, I was looking forward to see these people, and then they disappoint me enormously because they were talking in terms of disciplines. But that is a good example. That is what happens. That is what happens with sociologists, with urban planners, with anthropologists. They conceive the world in terms of a methodology. That is the only way in which they can actually talk about the world. So in that sense, for me, sort of working in a, in the, in a center for postcolonial studies, it's quite important to take seriously the title of this 
uh, this, this session. Go beyond discipline. For us, it's important because the first tenant of decolonization should be the decolonization of knowledge. It is the only important thing that we can do in terms of decolonizing ourselves. Sort of fighting against uh, the US or China now or whatever doesn't make that much, much sense. What we need to do is to deal with knowledge. So in that sense, the Center for Postcolonial Studies, or me personally, sort of have a, a, a kind of a manifesto. What is that we actually want to do? And what we actually want to do is three things. Can, this is what we are trying to do in, 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 in our center. The first one is to conceive the political. And I think that there's two ways of understanding the political. There's one very restrictive view of the political, a very colonizing view of the political. And that view of the political means that uh, sort of the political is conceived as the reduction of complexity. It's always to reduce things to the logic of one, one way of knowing, one way of sensing, one way of learning. There's just one way of doing everything. It has one advantage, perhaps. We are seeing it now in the age of populisms, that this kind of politics, this kind of sort of conception of the political, give us some sort of ontological security. Feel, people feel safe because there is some sort of certainty. That kind of, pol uh, of understanding of the political goes against complexity because complexity is uncertain, because complexity throws to sort of difficult questions. It sort of makes us feel the world as it is. And in many ways, the political, in this sense, is about reducing complexity. Yet, there is another very interesting way of thinking about the political. And that way of thinking about the political is about sort of enable the radical ima imagination of our societies. To imagine that there's other possible futures. We were talking about this this morning. But also, it's the possibility of imagining or questioning the very idea of future. Until what extent the idea of future is or only makes sense in a Western paradigm. If you go to the Andes, if you go to the Lacandon rainforest in Mexico, people don't care about the future. They don't have a conception of the future. That is a conception that is Judeo-Christian and modern. So in that sense, also is the possibility of imagining that the language that we have is not good enough. But that also is, is giving us chances of imagining new ways of existing in the world, of creating new communities, of making different languages. And that is something that for me is very important. I will talk about this in a second. Another thing that we are trying to do in the Center for Postcolonial Studies at Goldsmiths is to research new ways of colonialism. Colonialism is very much with us today. Sort of, sort of the, 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 the golden age of colonialism ended in the 20th century, yet still very much with us. But something that is important to recognize, it's not that interesting to say that sort of American imperialism or sort of Brazilian imperialism in Paraguay, what we have to understand is that colonialism now is moving, is changing, is evolving. It's sort of, uh, sometimes it colonizes nature, sometimes it colonizes cyberspace. It's sort of always, always changing. And in that sense, we need to be able to understand how colonialism operates in today's world. And the last thing that we are interested in doing is the critique of our political language. We, we think that the political language that we have is not really rendering reality. What we sort of, the words that we use are pretty, pretty sort of used and not necessarily good enough. When we talk about democracy, when we talk about rights, when we talk about freedom, when we talk about equality, all those concepts, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they're not working properly. They're not really doing justice what we want to, to the stuff that we want to do. And in that sense, we need to either get rid the link from that kind of language or give them new meaning to all these words. So that is the kind of thing that we want to do as our research agenda. And the only way of doing that kind of research agenda is to go beyond disciplines. 
No, we cannot sort of pretend to be sociologists and respond to these questions. We cannot pretend to be political sciences, scientists and respond to these questions. We have to go beyond disciplines. And in that sense, it's extremely important for us to sort of enable discussions with people that have different ways of understanding things. That is why we invited Felipe Castelblanco to do a residency in our center. The reason is this, it's very simple, and, and, and you will see what I mean. Felipe is capable of doing a very, very, very political art without using political words. And that's why we invited him to do a residency and start the Parasite School in Goldsmiths. Felipe. Let's see if this, this institutional form works. It might stay there for a quite long time, but maybe not. Hello, uh, thank you for this nice introduction. It's a great context to, to talk briefly about this project that um, started um, in 2011 called the Parasite School. So briefly, I will try to go quite quickly through a bunch of slides. Um, it is an attempt to, to think through a system. Sorry. We live here. That was planned, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a precarious institutions. OK, so it's a way to think about systems. And, and, it, and it started in the US at Carnegie Mellon when I was approached by a group of Latino uh, youth, which are basically, um, they were forming this group called uh, Jóvenes Sin Nombres, Youth Without Names. And they were trying to advocate for, for at the time, the Dream Act. So, now it became the DACA, so the Fair Action Program, where basically um, this would give um, young immigrants who came undoc as undocumented to the U.S. brought by their parents as minors, um, this would give them a, a legal status so they can access college. So when I was approached by them um, to do a sort of project around activism, um, I said, well, uh, what is it that you're trying to do? Because I'm not an activist, I'm sorry. I'm an artist, and I probably have other tools, but... Um, so they actually talk about... They wanted to, to, to push for this Dream Act. So I said, well, how about we present this other logic, where we, instead of proposing an activist project, we respond to, to it uh, by enacting the dream. So enacting the dream meant to ask them to come to the university as if they were students. Because, again, I was part of the system as a student, of a graduate student of Carnegie Mellon, and I immediately said, well, I, have the, I am a key part of this system. Literally, I have the keys to the university. So we created this uh, course that ran for about uh, first uh, six, six months. So it was like completely underground. We created a course for undocumented students as part of the Parasite School where I booked rooms, faculty, uh, resources, and then we produced a documentary. So the, the first course was about, was about filmmaking, using relational filmmaking strategies. Basically, as you saw previously, I'm teaching as well as passing the camera around. And then we produced this first documentary, um, which is their, vi their, their view of this um, struggle to achieve this uh, political um, agenda. We call it the Dream Act, so again, this idea of enacting dreams. It's like, if we have a dream of something, think of this as sleepwalking, right? We're doing it as we're dreaming. Um, this uh, approach took me to another project where I was invited to a conference similar to speak about Latino artists in the US, which I said, well, who am I to represent who? <laughs> so I decided to meet a lot of Latino people uh, in different cities. Uh, this one is in Portland. And then we talk about the strategies of the arts. So I used to normally tell, tell my, my friends and relatives, I'm an artist. And they were like, what, what is it that you do? And in order to summarize it, I said, well, I paint. So it, put me in, it made me think about the role of the painter. So I'm trying to, in the next six minutes, try to go through a few strategies. And one of them is thinking of, of loopholes and language and this space of miscommunication as a really potential space for action. So I met a lot of Latino workers who normally um, you know, stand on the streets in the US and also other cities. 
undocumented workers were waiting for like hour, like daily jobs. And then we met, and initially we like discussed the conditions in which they work. Uh, I was quite interested in the fact that they're actually painters, a lot of them. Um, so I proposed, I got a grant from a university and said, hey, why, why don't we just um, start something together, a business, <laughs> as part of a kind of business class. So we, we invested some money and got a van and an office. Mm. It was actually a gallery hall for me space. And then we talked through the conditions in which they work and they decided to run a house painting service where we had a space uh, where we can hang out, wait, advertise, and offer to paint people's homes. So someone could call, and I, something important is like, you set the price. So it was quite a good deal. So we invited people to call us, and then uh, we showed up to paint people's homes. So we, took, uh, we got in the van, and then, of course, showed up to the place and delivered our painting services. <laughs> so this basically meant that we were doing... So, so we, were, we were painting people's homes, literally. And, and it, like, no one could question that, right? But we're talking about undocumented labor. But however, it is legal to paint people's homes, right? If this is what we're doing. And, and thinking through the idea of labor itself, thinking and just creating a space for conversation about what is it that happens? How are the conditions of these workers? And as myself, what are the conditions of me as a cultural worker? So they got paid whatever I got paid when I was teaching or working for museums. So there was a salary, there were breaks, there was a place to sit, there was an office to go and wait. Um, we managed to make a lot of paintings and the art world went to be crazy and there was, was ones, these ones were auctioned, so we created an economy. The money went back to the business and then split. So quickly, uh, I created a residency as, as part of this idea, so I got a fellowship at the Royal Academy of at schools in London, a very sweet gig. So out of the residency, I created another residency where I invited artists who were not allowed to go into this academy to kind of para be parasites with me. So three residents, and then we had uh, an exhibition at the end. So in London, a lot of the academy has, is like the only free school in the, in the UK for arts, but only European and UK citizens can access because of the government regulations. So this was a way to kind of insert and find a loophole in the system. Now they still have this ongoing student um, residency for non-EU or UK citizens living in London or elsewhere. And last, we created this project called Borderless TV, which is basically a media collective. I was, again, invited to the city of Cologne by two organizations, and then I, I met um, a group of Syrian refugees because, like, like like them, I was also a guest in the city, like a new arrival, a newcomer. So um, we started to talk about like, making a film together, so in the end we basically just started to think about making a music video, which became trying to create a unit that can basically broadcast and create programs and, and use TV as a medium to actually use and express uh, the refugees' point of view in this conversation, to have like, self-representation tools. Um, so we had like screenings, and then we invited, for example, a lot of the um, guests who were coming for shows to actually be part of a reenactment situation where the refugees were directing the scene, and locals were actually acting on behalf, or like on the role of the refugees, so inverting these power relationships. Um, so this is one of the one of the pieces, is a quick song of a story. Sorry, I have to talk over. Um, of Admeh Hayud, who was a refugee who lived nine months in the city. And he unfortunately decided, well, after so many trouble with legal uh, status situation, he had to, to, he decided to go back to Syria. So with this group, Borderless TV, we pre produced a film of him. This is kind of a quick trailer um, before he went back. So the crazy part of the story is we don't know what happened to, to him. This is probably the last footage we, we have of, of him. And um, again, I guess the point here is to imagine how this, um, in a system, my, con my situation, my role in it is I'm an artist, I'm a practitioner, but I'm using my own position of little, little power to sort of redistribute, to be a parasite and actually like 
take from one organism to pass into another. And I think there's something about this. I don't see this project about, I don't see this as a project. I see it as a practice. And we all kind of do this practice. So I'm quickly, sorry, I'm going to have to skip here because I want to keep to the time. That's very precious, I guess. We want to um, do also this workshop uh, on Sunday, which is basically as part of the research uh, collaboration we have. It's called the Parapolitics School. Uh, please join us. We will rethink these political definitions of uh, well, today's political language, right? So just without taking more time of, of the other speakers, uh, I think I hope to see you on Sunday. Thank you. In randomness, we trust.